Hi, this is Emerald and welcome to the Diamond Net. And this is part two of the video that I made last week on the self in the Jungian psychological model. All right, so in the last video, I talked a lot about the relationship between the ego and the self. So the ego is basically what we think of as ourselves, and it's what we're talking about when we say I. So when I say I went to the store, I'm thinking this individual right here with these particular desires and these particular traits and these particular feelings and these particular whatever, you know, that's what my ego is. It's who I think I am. Now what the self is, is the what we really are underneath the ego. So it's what we actually are and it's the part of us that's actually in touch with the source the most. So this is the part of us that already knows every bit of wisdom that we could ever need to know and really has an access to divine wisdom and higher truths. In that video I also talked a lot about my own experiences of being in touch with the self and just how profound it was. Um, it, it was a 30 minute long video and I probably spent about 15 minutes of that video just talking about what my experiences were of the dropping away of the ego and how once I realized the self all fear of death dropped away and all of the repressed material things that I just didn't want to see about myself before when I was identified with ego just came up effortlessly and then the expansion of consciousness that came along with that and then just the dropping away of existential crises and other problems like that and it was it was like I really felt brand new it was like I could really sense the light of innocence that I thought had just not had gone away I just thought that as you grow up you just lose the joy and wonderment of life and that's just the way that it naturally is but it's only because we lose a more and more touch with the self and so I talked a lot about this experience that I had well actually there were two experiences I talked about the insights that came up and you know the reason why I focused on that so much is because there are such profound implications that being in touch with the self can have for your life because it really is just a complete and total shift in perspective so maybe if you're struggling with different hang-ups or different neuroses things that you just can't seem to quite shake it's probably because there's some part of you that's just very out of touch with that self aspect and so bringing yourself back into alignment with the self and back in tune with the self can really really help you uh, get rid of a lot of issues that you have maybe been struggling with throughout your life so I consider being in touch with the self and the deeper aspects of the psyche to be of utmost importance to living a good life because it's going to ultimately determine how authentic you can be to your own desires and to your own uh, feelings about things uh, otherwise you know you're just going to spend your life kind of lying to yourself and unintentionally maybe lying to other people and it's just going to send you in all kinds of directions that you wouldn't want to go in and you'll feel like sort of insulated from the experience of reality and what I've noticed is that this tends to get more and more intense as we get older because our ego uh, structure just becomes so complex because we're constantly adding things to that ego structure and so I think especially as we get older it's important to really look toward the deeper aspects of ourselves and make sure all of those aspects are fully integrated now one thing that I've noticed in having my channel for the past few years is that there are a lot of people who want to be more in touch with the self and to be in touch with God more and because of that they, they desire ego transcendence and they often come at it with a mindset that I find to be really unhelpful or they say oh I'm gonna destroy the ego or oh I'm gonna kill the ego and this actually ends up adding more to the illusion of ego because the ego is essentially a collection of thoughts so you can't really kill it and so saying oh I'm gonna kill the ego would be like equivalent to saying oh I'm going to kill my imaginary friend to rid myself of the delusion that I have an imaginary friend you know the fact that you're trying to destroy it sort of makes it seem like it's a thing that's there that's outside of yourself that there's a you that can somehow like destroy it and that becomes a problem because that's not really the way that it works 
So trying to kill or destroy the ego is a lot like when my cats try to chase around the flashlight uh, light and try to get the flashlight light and they don't know why they can't get it. It's because it's not actually a tangible thing. Now another problem with this thought process is that, and this is just my personal thoughts on it, having been in touch with the self and having felt the unconditional love that comes from being in touch with that because the self and God is unconditionally loving. It loves all things. And so I think personally, and this is just a thought, so take it with a grain of salt, that perhaps the reason why I was able to be in touch with the self is because I had truly let go and I was able to truly accept and love everything um, in reality as well. So I think it was my ability for unconditional love that maybe brought me into resonance with that aspect of myself. And so if you come at the ego and you say, oh, well, let's destroy or kill my ego, that puts you in resistance to ego. And so if you're resisting it, you're not really being unconditionally loving toward the ego. You're not accepting it as a valid aspect of reality, which it very much is. You know, everything that happens in reality is all essentially part of the same thing. So if you want to be in touch with the self, it's very, very important to practice non-resistance, especially to things in your internal experience so that you're not invalidating things and trying to ignore things and repress things. That's the opposite of what you want to do. Uh, so there um, was an, a myth in ancient Egypt called the weighing of the heart ceremony. So basically, whenever somebody would come in um, and they had just died, they would go into the, the hall of judgment to be judged. And they would put their heart on a scale, and on the other side of the scale would be a feather. So that if a person's heart was lighter than a feather, then they could pass on to the afterlife and be with the gods. But if they were not able to do that, like if their heart was any heavier than a feather, then they could not pass on and they could not be with the gods. Now, I think that, you know, this probably in ancient Egypt functioned as a kind of a morality tale, you know, saying that, you know, you need to do good things in order to be able to pass on in a positive way. But I personally look at this in terms of being in touch with the self and being in touch with God as well. So I think that if the heart is any heavier than a feather, then you're not going to be able to be in touch with that part of yourself because it requires perfect love because that thing, that self, is perfectly loving. And so whenever you are judging anything as bad or invalidating anything, including the ego, then that becomes a problem because that sets you 100 miles apart from where you're trying to go because your love has to be perfect. So it's basically saying that if you have any resistance at all to anything in reality, that you're probably not going to be able to let go enough to be open enough for the self to really break through into your conscious awareness. Now having said that, that's an awful lot to expect of oneself. Being unconditionally loving tends not to be very simple because we have so many layers of illusion stacked on top of this reality and so many layers of understanding in our worldview. So it often takes a lot of unlearning to get to the point where you can actually be open enough to be unconditionally loving. And I personally am not right now. You know, it, for me, it's very much a work in progress. And, you know, I'm always in the state of contemplation, like trying to sort of let go of the things that I get stuck on in, you know, like, like where I, you know, look at certain people and I, I judge them or I look at certain things happening in reality. I say, oh, no, that's wrong. I don't want that to be happening. You know, these types of things are the things that keep us from being unconditionally loving. And it's difficult to be able to look out at the world and see it just as it is and recognize the perfection in it when there are so many things going on that we would prefer to be a different way. Now that's not to say that those preferences are invalid, but the thing is if we look out at reality we have to realize that whatever is going on here is just part of the same thing and that same thing ultimately when you boil it down to its ultimate substance is actually love itself. And so you have to kind of be able to split yourself off, 
your human part can have your preferences and want things to go a certain way but then that deeper self part can recognize the perfection that is and be able to accept whatever is but to get to this point Carl Jung recommended the process of individuation this is where you first develop a strong and healthy ego usually in the first part of life and then you spend the second half of life you know really trying to look deeper into the layers of the psyche and get in touch with the anima or animus um, and you know integrate things from the shadow and through that you can be more in touch with the self and this would be a very gradual process that you would do throughout the entire rest of your life where you're just essentially drawing yourself closer and closer into that aspect of yourself and opening up yourself more and more dropping more and more resistance being able to accept more being able to love more and when we're able to truly be non-resistant what will happen is those aspects that we've repressed away and those things that we've hated in ourselves and maybe didn't want to see those things will come and back into our conscious awareness and they'll meet us and we'll recognize just how positive some of the things that we've repressed away have actually been and that we realize that those repressions were really unnecessary in the first part and so we'll become more whole in doing so and so this is essentially what processes like shadow work are about now usually what happens with repression is that you know it's not just a one-time thing where we've repressed that trait down and then that traits just repressed essentially what we have to do is we adopt an unconscious thought process of some kind that actually keeps that aspect of ourselves at bay and it's something that we have to constantly do but we're just so accustomed to doing it that we may not be aware of it so that's really why individuation is so important is because we have resistances that we don't know exist yet you know most of our resistances are happening at a layer just below the surface of consciousness and so we actually have to start questioning okay what's going on in my internal experience that maybe I'm not super aware of you know what are my judgments actually doing like what are those judgments that I maybe make out toward other people what are those keeping down in myself and maybe is that what the function of those judgments and maybe that's why I project judgment out onto other people because I need to keep those aspects of myself at bay all right so now I'm going to share some steps for individuation I also talked about these in the ego video that I have on my channel uh, it also says Jungian psychology up at the top uh, so the first one is to develop a strong and healthy ego get a really really clear sense of who you are as a separate individual and feel free to you know be a little bit creative with this you know really essentially when you're creating your ego you're creating your own masterpiece uh, but it should always be based in your authentic feelings it shouldn't be arbitrary so you should get a real sense of what your preferences are you know and how you feel about particular things and from there you can create values um, and opinions and just various things that you know you can know about yourself as an individual now once you actually have that strong healthy ego set then you can start the actual process of turning inward and so the first thing I recommend is to do shadow work so of course that's where you're you're trying to practice non-resistance and allow those aspects of yourself that have been repressed away or those feelings that you have have been repressed away that way if in lieu of any resistance they'll just come naturally floating up to the surface of consciousness like a buoy the third thing that kind of dovetails with this is to practice brutal honesty so a lot of our repressions come from the fact that we want to be seen in a particular way um, and we want to be able to see ourselves in a particular way and usually it has to do with our thought that oh being this way is good and being this other way is bad and so we'll have a tendency like if we judge something as bad or as maybe uh, not cool or as anything like that that we're going to want to keep that away from ourselves because we don't want to see that aspect of ourselves we want to make sure that we are the good guy in our own mind and so we might keep things away that just you know if we see it in another person that we would judge and because we judge it in the other person we keep it down to ourselves so when it comes to the process of individuation you want to be very brutally honest and be able to look at yourself in unflattering lights if something is true you know to really be able to perceive of yourself 
uh, warts and all with all of your flaws. Now this can be scary because this is sometimes like turning over a rotting log and you're really surprised about what you found there and it can sometimes like really feel like you know oh my gosh my demons are suddenly set loose on me but it's all worth it because it's what's going to help bring you more in tune with the self. And the fourth step um, is to drop judgment. So whenever we're judging outwardly and saying oh these people they're not good people or that I don't like what they're doing or they, you know whatever it may be you know and we're saying oh well that person's trashy I don't want to be anything like them what's happening is we're we're judging outwardly but that judgment also turns inward and becomes a repression so that's why you know dropping judgment is so important because it's never just a judgment outward it always comes back inward and it gives you less places that you can roam freely within your own psyche because if you're harshly judging someone's value based on what they're doing what you're going to do is you're going to judge your own value based on not doing that thing and so it's going to keep you in a very very small space in your internal experience now once you have a strong and healthy ego you can begin processes that may help you even transcend the ego so essentially you want to make sure that you have that strong ego in place and that you have a clear definite sense of self because that'll help you have motivation it will also help you keep from like crumbling under the weight of any kind of spiritual awakening you might have so if you have a strong healthy ego and you've gone through some of the process of individuation you can start these processes that I'm going to mention alright so the first thing is contemplation so contemplation is where you're really questioning the nature of reality and you're questioning how much you actually know so you're essentially looking at your beliefs and you're looking at reality and you're trying to separate the wheat from the chaff and what you'll find is that most all of it really is chaff you know a lot of our the way that we function comes through a mental framework and so all of that mental framework that's just the fodder of the mind and it helps us to interface with the world in a particular way but a lot of it doesn't necessarily actually have to do with what's going on here beyond appearances and so a lot of it has to do with stripping away belief and thought and mental frameworks and being able to perceive reality for what it is and so contemplation can help this because we can start to unlearn non-truth and sort of empty our cup so that we can be more receptive to what's actually going on out here in reality and what our uh, relationship is to reality now the second thing we can do is very very similar and really there's a quite a lot of crossover here because there's not really a distinction between self and the rest of reality but it's self-inquiry and so this is where you're actually trying to find where the individual self is so you can look around in your internal experience and find where is me like what is the center of my actual consciousness like where am I and then you can also try to see like where this sense of self begins and ends and you know through doing this it works a lot like contemplation where you're trying to like sort of separate your beliefs about what the self is and you're actually trying to perceive simply what is there beyond beliefs all right the third process that I'm going to recommend is to do meditation and specifically to focus on practices of meditation that help you uh, keep from getting your awareness swept up in the thought stream so what you'll notice if you look at your internal experience is that you know you can't really stop thinking but you can separate your awareness from thoughts because you not are yourself not thoughts so you can watch your thoughts but the but the thing is is that we often go unconscious and we get caught up in all of the thought stories and so because of that it's very very hard to get a clear experience of our internal experience and so this is why we have a tendency to be quite far away from the self and to not be able to perceive things accurately in our internal experience so if we're trying to focus on meditation processes that help us sort of anchor ourselves outside of that thought stream so we don't get swept away by it I recommend Vipassana meditation 
So this is where you essentially choose one object of focus that's an actual perception that isn't a thought and you focus on that and that way when the thought stream starts to pull you away and it will you know in, in probably relatively short order then you just become mindful again and you bring your focus back to that point so let's say that the main one I use when I do Vipassana meditation is the sensation of the breath on the tips of my nostrils and so whenever my mind starts to take me out of the moment and starts to, I start to get swept up in that unconsciousness, as soon as I become conscious again, I think, oh yeah, bring it back to that sensation. Now other people, you know, they could use a visual object for doing that or, you know, some other type of thing, some other sensation. It doesn't have to be the breath on the tips of the nostrils. It can be anything that's a sensory experience. But that way, you know, you're not getting caught up in those thoughts. And when you're not caught up in the thoughts, you can hear a subtler kind of voice, you know, so to speak. When we get a distance from our thought processes and we're not so caught down in it, things are become a lot clearer and we can get a more clear sense of the self. The second meditation process that I would recommend is one where you just do nothing and you just essentially you let the thought processes do whatever they're going to do. You're not trying to interfere. You're not trying to control your thoughts. You're just letting them kind of happen and you're not really focusing on a particular spot but you're just watching the whole thing happen and so that'll have the same effect so you're essentially it is a kind of Vipassana meditation in a sense because you're watching the thoughts go by themselves without getting caught up in them so you're using that sort of as your object of focus but you're keeping yourself hung back enough that you're not getting swept up with it Anyway, that's all I have for you for now. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, go ahead and click the like button below and subscribe. Also, leave me a comment down below. Let me know what you think. I love hearing from you guys. And also, I want to say thank you so much to my patrons. Um, and if you're interested in becoming my patron in exchange for various rewards, I'll leave a link down below in the description box. Also, if you would like to receive email notifications of when I release videos, um, you can go to the diamondnet.org and right on the home page, you can just fill out the content form. And you know, I never send out any spam. I, I just give you notifications for videos. It's going to be every Sunday. Also, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and click the bell right next to the subscribe button. That way, YouTube will actually notify you whenever I release a video. Um, so I didn't know that this was a feature before, but it's pretty cool. Um, so if you want to get um, notifications of my videos through YouTube, go ahead and click the bell. Anyway, that's all I have for you for now. Um, and until next time, keep becoming more you.